<clears throat> Our most uh, gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in joining together to study your word, a freedom that many in this world do not have. We thank you for all the many blessings that you pour upon us each and every day. Forgive us, Lord, when we neglect to give you thanks. We pray for our unsaved friends and family. We pray that something we or others might say or do might open their eyes to their sin and help them to realize their need for a savior. We pray for Pastor Brown's daughter who is undergoing surgery today. Be with the surgeons as they perform their tasks. May you lay your healing hands upon her. We pray for our leaders, that they would look to you for guidance in the decisions that they make. Continue to bless Pastor and Mrs. Brown as they fellowship with their family and friends. And we pray that you would bring them back safely to us. Allow your word to speak to us this evening. Give us a desire to learn more about you as we study together. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, let me see. I'm on there. Uh, let me see. Desktop editors, share. Okay, I hope you can all see that. Yes, we can see it. When I was preparing for this evening's Bible study, it occurred to me that two weeks ago when we covered chapter one that I neglected to, co to cover the last 11 verses, 20 through 30. So I'm going to go back to chapter one tonight to begin with and, and go through um, verses 20 through 30. There are some very powerful verses in there. Um, but we start with... Uh, we start with verse number 20, and this is chapter 1 of Philippians, uh, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Now, though Paul is confident of his release, he still has to face some form of trial. This could potentially end in death. After all of his troubles and tribulations, Paul was secure in his faith and confident that he would represent his Savior well. In fact, Paul is not only poised, he looks forward to the opportunity to speak about Christ. Paul speaks as if he's already won the battle, and he knows that no matter what happens to him, God will be glorified. Regardless of the outcome of his trial, Paul wanted to honor God. He was willing to do this either through continued life and ministry or through the kind of death he would endure. According to history, both were actually the case. Paul was released from this first Roman imprisonment and continued on with his ministry. However, he was ultimately arrested again and was incarcerated in Rome where he would die at the hands of the legal system. He remained faithful in both life and death, serving as a strong example for believers today. Verse number 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This verse offers some of the most memorable words in the entire Bible. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Regardless of whether the verdict of his case was life or death, Paul would remain faithful to God. He knew that life on this earth meant to live for Christ, but death would be even better because he would be in the presence of the Lord. Paul was in no hurry to die since it was important for him to spread the gospel as far as possible. These words are also important when discussing what believers, what happens to be what happens to a believer's soul upon death. Some have argued that soul sleep is possible. This is the view that the believer's soul enters a state of unawareness and does not go to heaven with the Lord until the future judgment. 
This verse shows the false nature of this teaching. Paul clearly states his expectation to be with Christ the moment his life on earth ends. This is a view also reflected by Jesus when he told the thief on the cross that he would be in paradise with him today. Verse number 22. But I live in the flesh. This is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. Paul confidently states that any time he, had let, he has left on earth would result in positive work for God. He did not see the remainder of his life as wasted time, even if he was to spend it in imprisonment. Instead, every moment of every day is to be considered fruitful labor or positive work that can be done for the Lord. Our choices in this life do matter, and Paul was well aware of how precious our given time is. This is one of the reasons Paul often refers to his years of rejecting Christ before his conversion. For as much as Paul wanted to serve God, the different outcomes before him created a dilemma. Naturally, he decided to be with Christ immediately. In some ways, death is preferable to life for the believer because it means living forever in the presence of the Lord. However, God also has plans for our life during the days we live. We are called to live every moment for his glory, allowing the Lord to define when we end our life on earth and begin our life, new life in heaven. Verse number 23. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Now here Paul continues to describing his dilemma. Living means serving Christ, gaining rewards, and giving him glory. At the same time, death means an end to suffering and an eternity to God with God. In heaven with the Lord, there will be no more sin, no pain, and no crying of any kind. This is certainly something believers should desire. It's encouraging in times of trouble to know that this is our destiny. There has always been tension for believers between these seemingly opposed desires. On one hand is our desire to please God and bring others to Christ. On the other hand, there's the rest and victory of heaven. The solution to this problem has always been the same. Our lives are meant to serve others, not ourselves. When we put God's will and the needs of others before our own will and needs, we can faithfully live focused on God's work. The timing of our heavenly arrival is in God's hands. Verse number 24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is, no, is more needful for you. Now, Paul has been musing about the conflict he feels at this time of imprisonment. Which does he want more? To endure persecution and preach the gospel or to be taken to eternity with Christ? Paul concludes that since God's will is for others to be saved, it is better for him to be alive. When God wills Paul's death, it will happen. Paul's focus must be to stay alive and serve others, including the Philippian believers. In fact, Paul seems to have a special burden for believers, such as the Philippians. His comment here specifically mentioned the readers of this letter as a reason for him to live on. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul will add a related note. The mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison. Paul was in prison because of following Christ. He wasn't there for personal failures or for something random. There was a God-given reason for it, though that didn't make it any easier to endure. The benefit of this persecution included the evangelism of many people in Rome, as well as influence through writing four prison epistles. Okay, well, let's pause there for the, those first five verses. Any discussion uh, of those of those five verses? Anything that 
jumped out at you or that you remember or that made you think of something else or? I just think the selflessness uh, expressed by um, Paul in these verses, it, it, it speaks volumes to his character and, and, you know, how much God was working in his life. And I'm sure that if we had that same, if we exercise that same level of dedication towards um, God's purposes for our life, you know, we would, we would feel the same way as far as, you know, looking forward to join in Christ in heaven, but at the same time, you know, having such a dedication to those, like you said earlier, you know, to, to continue the work of saving souls, you know, you, you can, it, it can be a little bit of a conflict, but, you know, just to show the, the, the priorities he had as far as his calling, you know, it's, it's just amazing how, how mightily God's spirit was working in him. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Cause it's a, it's a conflict that we all, face you know that you know we go between you know do i want to do i want to be in heaven or or do i want to stay here where there's i know there's pain and suffering and you know I, but then you know it, it it's in a way it's kind of selfish for us to to wish to be in heaven you know and to leave all this behind because like you said we have we have work to do here and uh and it's very important work and so it's it's just a conflict that we we all kind of face at one time or another, whether you know which <laughs> where where would we rather be you know where we rather be here or in heaven. It's something we just have to deal with, and like you said, in the the best way is for us to stay here so that we can win more souls for Christ, and so that there can be so there can be more people in heaven. Anything else anyone has to add? Okay, on we go with verse number 25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Paul doesn't merely hope that he will remain alive to continue ministry. He is convinced of this. He gives two specific reasons why he, fe why he feels this way as they apply to the Philippian believers. First, Though the Philippian church was growing more and more mature, Paul could continue to serve them. His purpose is to assist the Philippians to greater maturity. While it is not noted in the New Testament whether Paul ever returned to Philippi again, Paul appears confident that he would return. Second, Paul would remain for their joy in the faith. Faith involves both growth and joy. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The continued presence of a man like Paul would certainly encourage the people that he had been ministering to. Verse number 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by, by coming to you again. Here Paul anticipates seeing the Philippian believers again as a, as a moment of great joy. That would be a victory well worth praising God for. If Paul did return to Philippi after this first Roman imprisonment, they would certainly have given glory to Christ Jesus. Prior to this letter, the Philippian believers were probably uncertain whether or not Paul would ever live to leave Rome. In this letter, Paul believes he will soon be released and later visit them. This would be a miraculous answer to prayer. At this point, Paul has transitioned from reassuring his readers that his suffering is for a good cause to his confidence that he will survive to an encouraging hope for reunion. From the pastoral epistles, it is clear Paul did travel east again near the area of Philippi. However, Philippi is not mentioned in these later writings as one of his destinations. 
In addition to Philippi, Paul expected to once again visit Philemon in the city of Colossae. On to verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, in prior verses, Paul explained how his suffering was for the sake of Christ and encouraged his readers with a hope of reunion. In this verse, Paul gives the Philippian believers one assignment. In advance of his hoped for visit, live a life worthy of the gospel. This is very similar to the teaching Paul gave in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He says something similar in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10 encouraging others to live out the truth they proclaim. Paul desires these Christians to show unity to the world. This echoes the teachings of Christ, who emphasizes the importance of love in living out the gospel. Paul is calling on his readers to live out unity in one spirit and mind, working together for the faith of the gospel. His goal continually remained on the gospel, and it spread. Verse 28 reads, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. So here Paul encourages Christians to live with great courage rather than fear. The opponents he speaks of are likely the false teachers and antagonists mentioned in Acts 16. These enemies opposed Christianity and Christians in Philippi. Even though the Philippian believers were not facing the same level of persecution as Paul, they did face opposition in other ways. Christians throughout history have experienced every, every level of intimidation and different levels of oppression. Those who read Paul's words in modern free countries should realize how easy it is relatively speaking, to be a follower of Jesus as compared to the first century. When believers live without fear in the face of threats, it serves as a form of evangelism. It emphasizes the confidence that Christians have in the truth, which should be seen as a warning to those who reject their message. God's salvation can give great courage to believers, and at the same time, the courage of believers often reminds unbelievers of the uncertainty of their own afterlife. This partly explains why Christianity spreads so well under persecution. Only the true believers claim Christ, and true belief lived out in love is a powerful testimony. Verse 29 reads, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Paul clearly teaches that both believing and suffering were parts of faithful Christian living. His readers had likely already faced some persecution and may have wondered why they had to suffer if they were faithfully living for God. Paul makes it clear that godliness and suffering often go together. There are times when we suffer at the hands of the world because we are following the will of God. The world hates the gospel, and it will naturally try to stamp it out. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul will later note in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 and 10, For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Christ is worthy of whatever suffering a believer may face. 
In Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, Paul would write, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, notes the role of suffering in this way. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Verse 30. Having the same conflict with ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. Paul ends this chapter with a note regarding his own suffering. He was arrested in Palestine and appealed for the Roman legal system to escape an assassination attempt. During the sea voyage to Rome, the ship crashed and he and the crew barely escaped. A snake then bit Paul and he shook it off into a fire. He was eventually brought to Rome where he had been rejected by many Jews, yet had a powerful ministry to Gentiles despite being under house arrest for two years. Despite all of these past sufferings and his ongoing imprisonment, Paul was still able to preach to many, write letters to encourage believers, and be used of God to help encourage the spread of the gospel. Suffering is difficult, but is not without purpose. God has used pain and continues to use pain as faced by believers to accomplish much good. Paul's point here is also that the struggle he faces is exactly the same as it has always been. Whether the struggles are large or small, the same basic idea applies. The world which rejects God is working constantly to interfere with the spread of the gospel. Paul's experiences are simply the natural consequences of that battle. Okay, that's the end of uh, chapter one. Any discussion on any of those 11 uh, verses? Anything that, anything that can't comes to mind? I like what it says in verse 27, who's saying um, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And it reminded me of a, uh, a snippet of a video that I was listening to Pastor T.D. Jakes. And he was talking about how, how the demon legion was able to, to do what it was trying to do in the, the person's body that he was uh, um, possessing because it's called legion because they're all working together towards a purpose of destruction. Well, it's the, it's the complete opposite with the body of Christ. And it's very important that we work together and have the same mind. You know, it, we, we, we are more effective and more powerful through Christ working in us when we work together and we have that common love and share that bond especially when we pray in unison, you know, things move and things happen and it moves God when we come together on one accord on his behalf and he moves on our behalf as, in response. So I just think there's a, that, that verse speaks powerfully as to why it's important for us to, to have the same mind in Christ for the, for the faith of the gospel. Thank you. Okay, so we finished chapter one, the, the rest of chapter one that I hadn't covered the other night. So we're going to move on now to chapter three, Philippians three. When uh, what Paul was describing uh, in Philippians three was the, the spiritual mind and the spiritual mind he described professed Christians who mind earthly things. But then in Philippians um, chapter 3, verse 20, he described a believer with the spiritual mind who minds heavenly things. And you recall that the city of Philippi was actually a Roman colony, like, like a, a Rome away from Rome. And in the same sense, the people of God are a colony of heaven on earth. Our, citizenship is in heaven and we look at earth from heaven's point of view 
And this is the spiritual mind. Now, it's easy to get wrapped up in things, not only the tangible things that we can see, but also the intangibles, such as reputation, fame, achievement. Paul wrote about what things were gained to him in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. He also mentioned things which are behind and things which are before. In Paul's case, some of these things were intangible, such as religious achievements, a feeling of self-satisfaction, morality. We today can be snared both by tangibles and intangibles, and as a result, lose our joy. But even the tangible things are not in themselves sinful. God made things, and the Bible declares that these things are good. We see that in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. God knows that we need certain things in order to live. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. In fact, he giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. But Jesus warned us that our lives do not consist in the abundance of things that we possess. Quality is no assurance, I'm sorry, quantity is no assurance of quality. Many people who have the things money can buy have lost the things that money cannot buy. Now the key word in Philippians 3 uh, verses 1 through 11 is count. In the Greek, two different words are used, but the basic idea is the same, to evaluate or to assess. The unexamined life is not worth living, Socrates said, yet few people sit down to weigh seriously the values that control their decisions and directions. Many people today are the slaves of things, and as a result, do not experience real Christian joy. In Paul's case, the things he was living for before he knew Christ seemed to be very commendable. A righteous life, obedience to the law, the defense of the religion of his fathers, but none of these things satisfied him or gave him acceptance with God. Like many religious people today, Paul had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. It was not bad things that kept Paul away from Jesus. It was good things. He had to lose his religion to find salvation. One day, Saul of Tarsus, the rabbi, met Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And on that day, Saul's values changed. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 31. When Saul opened his books to evaluate his wealth, he discovered that apart from Jesus Christ, everything he lived for was only refuse. He explained in this section that there are only two kinds of righteousness or spiritual wealth works righteousness and faith righteousness and only faith righteousness is acceptable to God okay so we go let's look at the first three verses of chapter three finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe beware of dogs beware of evil workers Beware of the concision, for we, the circ for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, here at verse 1, when, when uh, Paul says finally at this point, it does not mean that Paul is about to close the letter because he keeps on going. The word means for the rest and introduces the new section Paul has warned the believers at Philippi before, but now he warns them again, look out for the dogs, look out for the workers of evil, look out for the mutilation. To whom was he referring in this triple warning? The answer takes us back into the early history of the church. From the very beginning, the gospel came to the Jew first, so that the first seven chapters of Acts deal only with Jewish believers or with Gentiles who were Jewish proselytes. In Acts chapter 8 verses 5 through 25, the message went to the Samaritans, but this didn't cause too much of an upheaval since the Samaritans were at least partly Jewish. But when Peter went to the Gentiles in Acts 10 
This created an uproar. Peter was called on the carpet to explain his activities. We see that in Acts 11. After all the Gentiles in Acts 10 had become Christians without first becoming Jews, and this was a whole new thing for the church. Peter explained that it was God who had directed him to preach to the Gentiles, and the matter seemed to be settled. But it was not settled for long. Paul was sent out by the Holy Spirit to minister especially to the Gentiles. Uh, we see that in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, and Acts 22, verse 21. Peter had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles in Acts 10, and Paul followed his example on his first missionary journey. It did not take long for the strict Jewish believers to oppose Paul's ministry and come to Antioch teaching but it was necessary for the Gentiles to submit the Jewish rules before they could be saved. This disagreement led to the conference at Jerusalem that's described in Acts 15. The result of this conference was an approval of Paul's ministry and a victory for the gospel of the grace of God. Gentiles did not have to become Jewish proselytes in order to become Christians, but the dissenters were not content. Having failed in their opposition to Paul at Antioch and Jerusalem, they followed him wherever he went and tried to steal his converts and his churches. <clears throat> Bible students call this group of false teachers who try to mix law and grace Judaizers. Bible students call this, uh, the epistle of the Galatians was written primarily to combat this false teaching. It is this group of Judaizers that Paul was referring to in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He used three terms to describe them. Dogs. The Orthodox Jew would call the Gentile a dog. But here, Paul called Orthodox Jews dogs. Paul was not just using names. He was comparing these false teachers to the dirty scavengers so contemptible to decent people. Like those dogs, these Judaizers snapped at Paul's heels and followed him from place to place barking their false doctrines. They were troublemakers and carriers of dangerous infection. Evil workers. These men taught that the sinner was saved by faith plus good works, especially the works of the law. But Paul stated that their good works are really evil works because they are performed by the flesh, the old nature, and not the spirit. And they glorify the workers and not Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 and Titus chapter 3 verses 3 through 7 make it clear that nobody can be saved by doing good works, even religious works. A Christian's good works are the result of his faith, not the basis for his salvation. The mutilation. Here Paul uses a pun on the word circumcision. The word translated circumcision literally means a mutilation. The Judaizers taught their, that circumcision, cir circumcision was essential to salvation. But Paul stated that circumcision of itself is only a mutilation. The true Christian has experienced a spiritual circumcision in Christ and does not need any fleshly operations. Circumcision, baptism, the Lord's Supper, tithing, or any other religious practice cannot save a person from his sins. Only faith in Jesus Christ can do that. In contrast to the false Christians, Paul described the true Christians, the true circumcision. He worships God in the spirit. He does not depend on his own good works, which are only of the flesh. He boasts in Christ Jesus. People who depend on religion are usually boasting about what they have done. The true Christian has nothing of which to boast. His boast is only in Christ. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, Jesus gave a parable that describes these two opposite attitudes. He has no confidence in the flesh. The popular religious philosophy of today is the Lord helps those who help themselves. It was also popular in Paul's day, and it is just as wrong today as it was then. 
By the flesh, Paul meant the old nature that we received at birth. But the Bible has nothing good to say about flesh. And yet most people today depend entirely on what they themselves can do to please God. Flesh only corrupts God's way on earth. That's from Genesis chapter 6, verse 12. It profits nothing as far as spiritual life is concerned. John chapter 6, verse 63. It has nothing good in it. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. No wonder we should put no confidence in the flesh. There is only one good work that takes the sinner to heaven, the finished work of Christ on the cross. Okay, let's look at the next three verses, verses four, five, and six. <clears throat> Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath the whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is in the law, blameless. The example, Paul was not speaking from an ivory tower. He personally knew the futility of trying to attain salvation by means of good works. As a young student, he had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the great rabbi. We see reference, reference to that in Acts chapter 22, verse 3. His career as a Jewish religious leader was a promising one, and yet Paul gave it all up to become a hated member of the Christian sect and a preacher of the gospel. Actually, the Judaizers were compromising in order to avoid persecution. While Paul was being true to Christ's message of grace, and as a result was suffering persecution. In this intensely autobiographical section, Paul examined his own life. He became an auditor who opens the books to see what wealth he has, and he discovers that he's bankrupt. Paul's intention, Paul's relationship to the nation. He was born in a pure Hebrew family and entered into a covenantal Convenantal relationship when he was circumcised. He was not a proselyte, nor was he descended from Ishmael, Abraham's other son, or Esau, Isaac's other son. The Judaizers would understand Paul's reference to the tribe of Benjamin because Benjamin and Joseph were Jacob's favorite sons. They were born to Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife. Israel's first king came from Benjamin. And the little tribe was faithful to David during the rebellion under Absalom. Paul's human heritage was something to be proud of. When measured by this standard, he passed with flying colors. Paul's relationship to the law. As touching the law, a Pharisee touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. To the Jews of Paul's day, a Pharisee had reached the very summit of religious experience, the highest ideal a Jew could ever hope to attain. If anybody was going to heaven, it was the Pharisee. He held to orthodox doctrine and tried to fulfill the religious duties faithfully. While we today are accustomed to use the word Pharisee as an equivalent of hypocrite, this usage was not prevalent in Paul's day. Measured by the righteousness of the law, Paul was blameless. He kept the law and the traditions perfectly. Paul's relationship to Israel's enemies. It's not enough to believe the truth. A man must also oppose lies. Paul's defended, Paul defended his orthodox faith by persecuting the followers of that deceiver, Jesus. He assisted at the stoning of Stephen. We see that in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60. And after that, he led the attack against the church in general. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Even in later years, Paul admitted his role in persecuting the church. Every Jew could boast of his own blood heritage, though he certainly couldn't take any credit for it. Some Jews 
could boast of their faithfulness to the Jewish religion, but Paul could boast of those things plus his zeal in persecuting the church. So at this point, we might ask, how could a sincere man like Saul of Tars be so wrong? The answer is he was using the wrong measuring stick. Like the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22, and the Pharisee in Christ's parable, Luke 18, 10 through 4, verses 10 through 14, Saul of Tarsus was looking at the outside and not at the inside. He was comparing himself with standards set by men, not by God. As far as obeying outwardly the demands of the law was concerned, Paul was a success, but he did not stop to consider the inward sins he was committing. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made it clear that there are sinful attitudes and appetites as well as sinful actions. When he looked at himself or looked at others, Saul of Tarsus considered himself to be righteous, but one day he saw himself as compared with Jesus Christ. It was then that he changed his evaluations and values and abandoned works righteousness for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay, any discussion on those first six verses? I, one thing that came to mind when you were speaking there near the end um, was something that said elsewhere in scripture it says, you know, to gain the whole world and, and lose your own soul, that's a dire situation to be in. Um, you know, you spend your whole life striving and thinking you're accomplishing something, but the whole time we were the wrong way. glorifying <laughs> ourselves, we're glorifying our flesh. You know, God is not getting any of that glory. And that's kind of what I see here when he's listing all these accolades. Um, and it's something that we as believers, we have to be mindful of as we go about our daily lives, making sure that God remains the, uh, uh, at the head of all things instead of uh, things uh, getting ahead, putting things ahead of God. Yeah, we may think we're going in the right direction, but then we then we wake up. God, God wakes us up and makes us realize we're not going in the right direction. That we're being we've been misled. Anyone else? Anything or anything else? And he certainly woke Paul up. He, <laughs> I mean, he blinded him. You know. Blinded him yeah. and turned, turned his life around. And that's a good thing, like, you know, <clears throat> everything that all the all the um, character traits that Paul possessed that was working against God, God was able to turn that all around to use yeah. to work for his will. And, you know, God sees all the things that are in us that could benefit the gospel. And um, he could definitely use all of us in a mighty way just like this, you know, is what we have to be shaken out of our worldly perspective so that we can see clearly from his perspective. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to verse number seven. Now, when Paul, when Paul met, uh, Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road in Acts 9. He trusted him and became a child of God. It was an instantaneous miracle of the grace of God, the kind that still takes place today, whenever sinners will admit their need and turn to the Savior by faith. Now, when Paul met Christ, he realized how futile were his good works and how sinful were his claims of righteousness. A wonderful transaction took place. Paul lost some things, but he gained much more than he lost. Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. To begin with, he lost whatever was gained to him personally apart from God. Certainly, Paul had a great reputation as a scholar. 
and a religious leader. He was proud of his Jewish heritage and his religious achievements. All of these things were valuable to him. He could profit from them. He certainly had many friends who admired his zeal, but he measured these treasures, but he measured these treasures against what Jesus Christ had to offer, and he realized that all he held dear was really nothing but refuse compared to what he had in Christ. His own treasures brought glory to him personally, but they did not bring glory to God. They were gained to him only, and as such were selfish. This does not mean that Paul repudiated his rich heritage as an Orthodox Jew. As you read his letters and follow his ministry in the book of Acts, you see how he valued both his Jewish blood and his Roman citizenship. Becoming a Christian did not make him less a Jew. In fact, it made him a completed Jew, a true child of Abraham, both spiritually and physically. Nor did he lower his standards of morality because he saw the shallowness of pharisaical religion. He accepted the higher standard of living, conformity to Jesus Christ. When a person becomes a Christian, God takes away the bad, but he also takes the good and makes it better. Paul's gains. Again, we are reminded of Jim Elliott's words, who said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he can lose. This is what Paul experienced. He lost his religion and his reputation, but he gained far more than he lost. Verse number eight. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I, am, I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. The knowledge of Christ. This means much more than knowledge about Christ because Paul had that kind of historical information before he was saved. To know Christ means to have a personal relationship with him through faith. It is this experience that Jesus mentioned in John chapter 17, verse 3. You and I know about many people, even people who lived centuries ago, but we know personally very few. Christianity is Christ. Salvation is knowing him in a personal way. Verse number nine, and be founded him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. The righteousness of Christ, righteousness was the great goal of Paul's life when he was a Pharisee, but it was self-righteousness, a works righteousness that he really, that he never really could attain. But when Paul trusted Christ, he lost his own self-righteousness and gained the righteousness of Christ. The technical word for this transaction is imputation. It means to put to one's account. Paul looked at his own record and discovered that he was spiritually bankrupt. He looked at Christ's record and saw that he was perfect. When Paul trusted Christ, he saw God put Christ's righteousness to his own account. More than that, Paul discovered that his sins had been put on Christ's account on the cross. And God promised Paul that he would never write his sins against him anymore. What a fantastic uh, experience of God's grace. Uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 30 through chapter 10, verse 13 is is a parallel passage and you, you should read it carefully. But what Paul said about the nation Israel was true in his own life before he was saved. And it is true in the lives of many religious people today. They refuse to abandon their own righteousness that they might receive the free gift of the righteousness of Christ. Many religious people will not even admit that they need any righteousness. 
like Saul of Tarsus, they are measuring themselves by themselves or by the standards of the Ten Commandments, and they fail to see the inwardness of sin. Paul had to give up his religion to receive righteousness, but he did not consider it a sacrifice. Verses 10 and 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The fellowship of Christ, when he became, when he became a Christian, it was not the end for Paul, but the beginning. His experience with Christ was so tremendous that it transformed his life. And this experience continued in the years to follow. It was a personal experience that I may know him. As Paul walked with Christ, prayed, obeyed his will, and sought to glorify his name. When he was living under law, all Paul had was a set of rules. But now he had a friend, a master, a constant companion. It was also a powerful experience and the power of his resurrection, as the resurrection power of Christ went to work in Paul's life. Christ liveth in me, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Read Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 23, and chapter 3, verses 13 through 21, for Paul's estimate of the resurrection power of Christ and what it can do in your life. It was also a painful experience and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul knew that it was a privilege to suffer for Christ. We see that in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. In fact, suffering had been a part of his experience from the very beginning. As we grow in our knowledge of Christ and our experience of his power, we come under the attack of the enemy. Paul had been a persecutor at one time. But he learned what it means to be persecuted, but it was worth it. For walking with Christ was also a practical experience being made conformable unto his death. Paul lived for Christ because he died to self. He took up his cross daily and followed him. The result of this death was a spiritual resurrection that caused Paul to walk in newness of life. Paul summarized this whole experience in uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Yes, Paul gained far more than he lost. In fact, the gains were so thrilling that Paul considered all other things nothing but garbage in comparison. No wonder he had joy. His life did not depend on the cheap things of the world, but on the eternal values found in Christ. Paul had the spiritual mind and looked at the things of earth from heaven's point of view. People who live for things are never really happy because they must constantly protect their treasures and worry lest they lose their value. Not so the believer with the spiritual mind. His treasures in Christ can never be stolen and they never lose their value. Okay, any discussion on those first 10 verses of chapter 3? Anything at all that jumps out at you? Okay. Well... That is all I have prepared for this evening. Um, I thank you for your attendance. I thank you for your comments. Um, and uh, if no one else has anything more to add, um, I will close our Bible study in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for 
witnessing to each of us as we study your word. We pray that we would share it with those we meet so that they too can share with us in the joy of your salvation. We pray, Lord, that you be with us the remainder of this day. Watch over our families and, and be with us as we go about our daily tasks. Help us to ensure that we do all we do as unto God. Continue to watch over and protect us, and we'll be careful to give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.